Yeah, what is good, everybody? It's your boy BQ with your Impact Lounge Impact Wrestling Review. I did attempt to live stream this beforehand, and uh, internet was not cooperating with me. I pay like 200 bucks a month for this shit. Like, I, I assure you, I have the best possible internet, and I'm just having I have issues whenever I try to record and stream. It drives me absolutely fucking crazy. My kids can all simultaneously game, have TVs on, but I try to stream and I can't. It drives me nuts. So, um, reviews will be like this going forward. And um, hopefully, hopefully the audio issues on this end are, are not not too bad. So we're going to get into this episode of Impact. I'm not going to talk about Scott Demore. I've, I've talked about that ad nauseum on two episodes prior to this. So uh, we're not going to get into all that. We're just going to kind of talk about uh, this past episode. Uh, tonight, we are going to, my family and I, we're going to AEW Collision. Yes, that show is the shits. That company's, all their shows are the shits. But um, it's a family event. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, the kids enjoy wrestling as a family no matter what promotion we're going to so why not their their arena is like 13 minutes from the house it's in the same city we live in so um you know why not i got the tickets free as well so fuck it you know so um my two older kids my wife and myself we're all going to aw collision tonight and hopefully it's okay hopefully hopefully it's a, a decent show um the kids do not enjoy the big arena stuff as much as like going to impact or nwa or something like that because we can just be closer to the action meet the wrestlers or whatever you know what i'm saying so yeah let's get into this uh episode of impact i thought it was better than last week i actually i, th I think it was probably the second best episode they've done so far uh, in this new tna era um i got i gotta get on my high horse real quick about the production quality what's kind of dawned on me is that they have default settings and you cannot use default settings for anything when you're doing uh when you're eqing audio or your or your um doing video you cannot for when it comes to levels you cannot use default settings because when you're a new arena everything's different the the ambient lighting is different the light the general lighting for the arena is different uh the cameras are in a slightly different place as, as the last arena um there's just there's just a lot there's a lot of intricacies and when you you when you use default settings, that's why some episodes look horrible and some look okay. And I thought this one looks so fucking bad. Um, there, there was a point where Khan and PCO were in the ring. They're both wearing black. Security has black. The crowd is blacked out. It looked like two heads fucking floating with two heads and with, with a set of arms floating in air. Horrible. Um, it's starting to, as the, as the weeks pass, it is starting to feel more like the impact wrestling era with logos and ropes and i gotta be clear though do i think the episode i mean the, uh, the the shows are better now yes i do i think the matches are fresher i think the graphics are tremendous love the yellow ropes love the entrance uh love the transitions there so there's a lot that i'm really enjoying right now i just want to make that clear for the sake of not like contradicting myself they are doing more good than they're doing bad but they've decided that the way they present television is sufficient. It is not going to change. It is not going to get better. That's how it's going to look. And that is the impact wrestling era. And it's such a strong part of the show that it's just going to feel more like impact than it is the new era of TNA, especially with Scott not being around anymore. So um, I do think again, it's much better, much, much better, but um <clears throat> excuse me as the weeks pass it is just starting to feel more like impact and that was my um that was a lot of people's biggest concern so uh chris Sabin kicked off the episode taking on john schuyler i wish this was jason hotch here if you haven't seen explosion and jason hotch versus rich swan that was an excellent match you definitely got to check that out jason hotch is very good john schuyler gets the job done he cuts these promos on the way to the ring and they do not hit. He's a good talker, but the content doesn't hit. I don't know if the crowd just doesn't feel that it's genuine. Um, if the crowd thinks these guys are jobbers, so who cares what he has to say? But, you know, when he came out and started yelling shut up at at um, at Jade, that was okay. You know, I, I think he came out and I, I, I liked how they come off. But the minute he starts talking... And I don't remember if it was explosion or impact, but I know he said the most popular person in in Florida is a cartoon mouse or something. 
it was so quiet you could hear the person in the last row fart. It's it's the promos are not hitting. Um, I think he just goes for the cheap heat a little too much, and it's just it's just not quite connecting. But you know, maybe if these guys get a little more momentum, we see him a little bit more. Like who knows? You know, I don't think they did a good job when they teamed them up with Bully of really establishing them them as a stable. I don't think they established them as winners. Uh, they just kind of established them as stooges for hire. So maybe going forward, they can do a little bit more with these guys uh, to where people actually care what John Schuyler has to say when he comes down. But he can talk. He can definitely talk, but it's it's the material's not quite hitting. Uh, this match with Chris Saban wasn't bad, though. I You know, again, like I kind of wish it was Jason Hotch here, but, you know, uh, but John Schuyler holds his own. We knew that Chris Saban was going to win this match. I mean, God, uh, is it just... You know, this is more of a showcase for him, but you know, overall it was good. And you know, the, the crowd did start booing Skyler halfway through the match or telling chanting fuck you or something like that. I don't remember exactly, but they got into it. But his just the opening promo just caused the opening match, the first half of the open match to be so quiet. And I, I see people kind of dragging this Orlando crowd through the mud on social media, and I I think they sound fine. I, I don't think they're like a dead crowd. I don't think the crowd is you know, just in totality of people there. I don't think there's as few people there as, as people are trying to say there are. I think it looks good. It's just that it's dark and you can't see anybody. But I think the crowd is decent. I thought they were engaged and I have I have I have no issues with with it. But yeah, um Chris Saban wins um and then he's gonna lose to Mustafa Ali at No Surrender. I think that's the name of the next show, right? Um yeah he's gonna lose there. And um, as I said, Mustafa Ali would likely win the X Division title in his first match, and that is exactly what they're booking to happen. Kim Miller's backstage with these interviews. She looks like she's wearing uh, one of the wedding dresses my wife turned down when she was getting fit. Uh, again, these, these uh, backstage segments look horrible. Um, you can't even see. Like Alex Shelley looks like a head with a shirt and tie floating in air. Um, if, if, like if you guys watch Explosion, Explosion when Jim Miller does it around the ring, it, it looks great. Like when she's interviewing, it looks. Why can't it look like that on Impact? Like why do they have to do this and have them talking in the fucking dark? Like it looks great on Explosion. Do that. It is. It's like it's right in front of your face. How can you not see the improvement? I understand maybe you're trying to get it to like maybe feel a little different, but uh, for, don't don't for the sake of feeling different have one look like shit still stuck on Zaya Brookside enjoyed this match as well I really like Zaya Brookside I like her a lot she has a great baby face she's got a great theme I think the crowd is going to really continue to get behind her as time goes but she's she's excellent Tasha Steeles is excellent I'm watching this match though and Tasha is such a good heel but she could be a just massive baby face for them and it just seems like they don't want to get there they don't want to pull that trigger but it does make sense to me because the heels are, they don't have heels. The the knockouts division does, does not have um, a good heel. Ash by elegance is going to come save the division because um, you just, that's why Giselle Shaw is wrestling for the title. You know, they, they got to um, build that side of the division up a little bit. Like you lose Kylan King, you lose Deanna Perrazzo, who I believe was a heel on the way out. Like she, they switched her baby face for a little bit, but, you know, you you lost some people and they were building the division for the last year or so on babyface versus babyface. It was Jordan versus um, Mickey James and Mickey James versus did she wrestle Trinity? I don't remember. Um, that might have been who she won the title from. Right. I don't even recall at this point. Uh, every every match that Trinity seemed to have was versus a babyface opponent. Hugs, handshakes and high fives. So no one got any heat. Uh, I was going to talk about this later, but I'll, I'll just talk about it now. Trinity and Grace did get more over by be, beating Trinity a couple times, but nobody got any heat in this whole almost year, eight months or whatever, that Trinity was with TNA. No one got any heat. They were unable to build any heels. It was just, again, what I just said and what I've been say, saying. It's hugs, handshakes, high fives, just just no heat whatsoever. Um she wrestled Giselle Shaw a few times, Deanna a few times. She just completely fucking ran through them. 
and now they are stuck you know the, the people at anthem and in creative they're playing with their dicks like i don't know what to do to to build any real heat uh for the heels so um you cannot change uh, tasha steals over to being a baby face at this point like she will be a massive baby face when the time comes but they have to run with her a heel, as a heel at this point they probably have to run with her as a, a challenger for Jordan Grace here in the short term. But most likely, Ash by Elegance is going to wrestle immediately for the championship and probably win it as well. But uh, yeah, I enjoyed, I enjoyed Tasha Steeles versus I Brookside. The match was, I mean, the uh, finish was no bueno, however. They tried to play it up that uh, Zaya tried to hit the Brooksy bomb, but then she got rolled up and Tasha Steele's had a handful of tights. She had a handful of nothing. And I, I, the tights thing is so ridiculous. It is so like played out. Like just because you have a handful, they're like, oh, well, you cannot possibly kick out of this now. Even the where she, the where she was grabbing them with the tights, like had no effect on Zaya Brookside's ability to kick out of that move. So it looked bad, and I think it looked worse for the live crowd because they didn't know what happened. I wouldn't have known. They showed the both of these girls' asses on the screen, and I don't think I would have known she hooked the tights. Or, I mean, I didn't know she hooked the tights. The The uh, announcers kind of had to say it. But I think these two are going to feud for a little while, and I'm, I'm here for it. Like, I've enjoyed both their matches so far. But, but again, I like Zaya Brookside a lot, a lot, a lot. Um... And then they got the ABC backstage talking in the hallway that they lost the match uh, best of three series. I hate best of series because you know you're getting the final match. You know you know you're getting match seven or match three or match five or whatever it is. You know you're getting it. Same with like two out of three falls matches. It's just it's not a stipulation that I enjoy. Because and then I'm just watching these guys like we're just watching wrestling at this point. Like I'm not invested in the winner. Because Grizzle Young Vets won, so ABC is going to win the next one. We just we just already know that. But I think a lot of you guys enjoy their tag team matches more than I do. I was just I was really like bored through this because I just don't care for the Grizzled Young Veterans. Like I don't, I'm not like oh I hope they sign like a lot of people. Like I I could do without them. Um, but this was a very good little promo here from the ABC. I saw someone on Twitter ask Ace. ASOS, not ASOS, but Chris Bay. Like, what does ABC stand for? And and I don't know if it's a gimmick, but he Chris Bay usually responds pretty rude to people. And <laughs> these guys are fucking baby faces. And he said, um, Ace and Bay connection, or Ace, he said, Ace and Bay Club. What's so hard to understand about that? I've said this on the show, so I'm not making this up. They have called them the Ace and Bay Connection. On this show twice. The time that they debuted and last week. And even someone in the con in the comments was like, I didn't know what it stood for either until this last week. And they've never called them the Ace and Bay Club. I know that the graphic says Ace and Bay Club, but they have never. The ring announcer has never been like the Ace and the Ace and Bay connection, A, B, C. They've just been A B C. So so there was no clarity so i think it was a very you know i don't think the question was out of left field like the guy's just like what is c fan i didn't even know what the fucking c stands for i covered this damn company i just know when they they you know they debuted changing their name from bullet club i don't know if debut is the right word but they said ace and bay connection the tron says ace and bay club no one ever calls them any of those fucking names so i wasn't even sure if it changed or, or what happened but um he did call it the Ace and Bay Club. Tom called it the Ace and Bay Connection last week. Horrible branding. Horrible. Um, and then he got attacked by the Grizzle Young veterans afterwards. And then security showed up like 10 minutes later. And um, I, w w next thing that happened that I really liked was Frankie Kazarian walking around backstage. And I'm here for the Frankie Kazarian stuff. He's a great pro, a great wrestler, a great promo. Like this stuff is really good that he's doing to where he's. He's not kind of he's not totally switching it. He's still saying like, "Yo, I run this place. I am TNA." He's not like turning his back on TNA and the rebranding. He's just saying, you know, if we're rebranding, I got to be the guy. You know, so I, I thought it was. I, I think it's a really good. Um, they showed him cutting the promo and Eric Young kind of looking at him backstage. They're keeping Eric Young off TV. 
kind of selling selling the, the beat down a little bit, but they're letting the Frankie Kazarian character build a little bit before they bring Eric Young on screen. Like if this were AEW, Eric Young would have been showed up the next episode and attacked him and taken any context out of out of the story. There's two good stories going on right now. The system is not a story. The system is the best part about the show. But the Frankie Kazarian story with Eric Young, and you guys probably not going to agree with me on this, but the AJ Francis shit with with um, Rich Swan and maybe even Diener. But there's no other stories actually going on. <laughs> so yeah, by default, they're the best stories. Uh, but they're, that's what that's what I have, what I'm invested in right now. And then we got Mike Bailey versus Zachary Wentz. This was really, really good as expected. I think this would have been a little better of an opener, but just very good match. The crowd was very into it, and they had to get Wentz their, his win back because you know they, they've got him teamed up with Macklin, and um, we don't want him to be losers. And Mike Bailey can take losses at this point. Mike Bailey, when he loses, it doesn't really hurt him. Number one, because he's very popular with the people. Number two, he never comes off as a jobber. And number three, he never loses clean. It, they, they always cheat, uh, cheat, and then he looks all goofy after the match. But this was really good. If you haven't seen this, go out of your way to see it. Um, of course, Miguel trips Bailey off the top of the rope. And Wentz hits this UFO cutter, and I hate cutters, but he basically bounces off the ropes um, and hits a cutter. It looks really good. Really, really good. Speaking of good cutter, when I was talking about explosion on my last upload, Rich Swan hit a lethal injection cutter on Jason Hotch, and he sold the shit out of that. That, that was just you just really got to go back and watch that. I think I think you guys will enjoy it. But yeah, Zach Wentz gets the win here, and guess what the fuck happens after? It's a post match beatdown again, and then the music plays, and it's Trent Seven, and he's standing there with no sense of purpose to get to the ring. He's even like cutting a promo on the way to the ring. Mike Bailey's getting his ass kicked and this dude walking slow as fuck. Like maybe he'll get down there. I mean, I would have loved to have timed this dude. Like if I was getting jumped, I hope that like my brother or something would not just show up and just, just walk like he's taking a freaking stroll down the street. But it looks like they're going to kind of go with Mike Bailey, Trent Seven versus the Rascals thing. So that's cool. It'll be interesting to see if they add a third person to this since, you know, Macklin is involved. Um, but yeah, but then it's Steve Macklin showed up at the end and Nick, Nick, Nick Nemeth did. I mean, it's the same shit week to week with these, these post-match angles. They're really struggling creatively right now. That's why I said the best story is this AJ Francis shit. Like he's he's backstage creating a story. He hasn't attacked anyone. I mean, I guess he did choke slam Joe Hendry at one point, but he's not sneaking up on people. He's not attacking. He's not even wrestling. He's not even part of this company. He's advertised for NWA coming up. So we're kind of, it's the same format here, the same formula, what we're thinking. They're bringing people in and signing, and they're just here for a little bit. They're just, it's a booking. Um, outside of like Trent Seven, Kushida, and, and Ash by Elegance, these guys are here for for fucking bookings. So, um, and, and especially now that Anthem has basically said that, hey, we're cheap asses, they're not going to resign Nick Nemeth long term. I, I can't, I can't imagine that. But they're doing a good job here. You know what? I, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna retract a little bit. The Nick Nemeth and and Macklin storyline is pretty good too. I know that it's built off post match beatdowns, but the promo that Macklin cut on him on the first TNA episode was excellent and it set the tone for this feud. So um, I will say that's a good story as well, you know, but there's really, there's really not a lot storyline going on right now. And I hope that improves. Here's a story. Khan is the self-proclaimed baddest man in TNA and he's now Khan. He's not, he's not big Khan. Um, I get, was there a commercial on this that they're bringing back the action figures? I'm looking at this, uh, what it says in the recap here. I don't remember them saying anything about it. I will believe it when I see it when these action figures come out. That's that's all I'm going to say. Rhino cut a promo. Um, that was pretty good. I like that they 
you know, the camera was moving around and was shaky. Like it just, it just gave it, you know, I, I was, I was feeling it was something, something new, something different. Says he doesn't give a shit about social media. Rhino is cursing a lot on this show. That is his new gimmick is just say as many curse words as possible. Maybe he listens to my podcast uh, since I've got a similar gimmick. Uh, but yeah, he says he doesn't give a shit about social media. He just wants the title. None of us give a shit about the title. So um, then we got. Yeah, okay. Then we got the match that either should have been the main event or should have kicked off the show, which was Jordan Grace and Trinity versus Giselle Shaw and San Savannah Evans. I said this last week. I think they were ice cold going into this match because they they didn't wait they or they waited too long to show this match. I would have whatever you had to do in editing. I would have had this this match on last week with the Jordan Grace Royal Rumble stuff. Like Tom Hannafin, bless his heart on commentary, is still trying to uh, WWE Royal Rumble. Bro, like this shit was so last week. There's so much shit that has gone on since then. Like the Royal Rumble has been overshadowed because of the whole Rock situation. You know, and then obviously there's the Scott stuff going on in the TNA world. The I the iron is now cold on this, so um, it really should have happened last week. They should have showed, showed the Jordan Grace footage from the Rumble to kick off the show, and then advertise the match for the episode as the main event. Speaking of the opening video package was a lot shorter, and they got down to business about two two minutes into the episode, which is kind of what I want to see. You know, four, four and a half minutes is too long. People are going to tune out. So this match here, I thought Giselle Shaw and Van Evans were going to win. I know that's just like, like, why would they, you know? But in my mind, I was like, that's the only, like, I get why Jordan and Trinity would win. Jordan's the champion. Trinity's Trinity. She doesn't lose to anybody. But I was just like, Giselle is going to wrestle for the title. Giselle has been really, for lack of a better term, a job over the last two years. They have no heels, credible heels. So they had to have a win of the Ultimate X, which no one ever wins when they cash that thing in. Savannah Evans um, is not, not progressing as a character. I would not be surprised if she was. I think they said, uh, I didn't see it on the episode unless I just missed something. But I think I saw it on Twitter that it was saying Savannah Evans, or excuse me, Giselle Shaw fired the, the Shaw Taraj. Jay Vidal has to be with her. Um, has to. <laughs> he will not work anywhere else on the card. Savannah Evans, she's just playing the been, been playing the bodyguard role for a couple of years. I don't think it's getting over. I just wouldn't be shocked if she wasn't, if they really are like breaking the stable up if she's if she's gone. Um or do something to establish her as a credible singles heel, which I would prefer. I don't want them to get rid of her. I would rather they creatively try to, like what they're trying to do with Khan, try to do that with Savannah Evans, try to build something where she's, we can look at her as a standalone character now and not someone's bodyguard. Um, but if they break her off the Shantaraj, she'll probably go babyface too. So I, I don't know what the hell they're going to do, but this division is in trouble right now. There's no shortage of women who would join a knockouts division, but you know, because they went through a whole year of Trinity beating everyone and no one getting any heat and Trinity having baby face versus baby face matches. They're in a and then they have Mickey James depart. You have Gianna Perazzo depart. Um, there was one other, right? Well, yeah, Trinity, she's departing. Like that they're in a real fucking tough place right now. Ash by Elegance needs to be the savior. Like this character needs to hit. Because if this comes out and it's a, it's a fucking fart in a bucket, this this division's gonna be in in deep trouble. But overall, the match was good, and um, I just I know it, I know this is Trinity's hometown, Orlando, whatever. But man, imagine if Giselle Shaw gets a little heat by pinning, pinning Trinity, who's already on the way out the door. Everyone everyone else was saying, well, Deanna Peraza is on the way out the door. That's why she's losing every match. And I said they're not gonna do that to Trinity. I know that Trin's a bigger star, but you know what Deanna did for the company for so long, she didn't deserve that. But you know they don't want to; they're not going to beat Trinity. On Jordan's the only one; it's probably in her contract. They only lose it to Jordan. But now Giselle Shaw going into this no surrender match, and she's not going to win. She has no momentum. 
And they could throw a curveball and have Giselle Shaw win, but given everything Jordan has done with the Royal Rumble, I don't see them taking the title off her. I don't think she needs the belt at this point, but I would just be shocked. If Trinity is the champion for as long as she was and Jordan takes it off her and beats her twice, I just don't see Giselle Shaw walking away with it. This, um, by the way, Trinity's starstruck finisher does not look like it hurts. Julia Hart does something similar in AEW. I forget, Black Hearted, or I don't even, I might be pulling that out of my ass. She has a very similar move. Neither of them look like they hurt. They don't look like they're t- really pulling on anything to where you should tap out. It looks like, it looks like it probably feels good. Like the chiropractor, you go there and the, the, ch- the chiropractor, a masseuse would do that to you to, uh, to stretch out your neck and, and get you loose and limber, you know? But, um, yeah, Shaw was clearly, clearly defeated and upset after the match. But I, I think this knockouts division is in a, a bad place right now. They, they can get it back on track. They always do. But I, I, I don't like the position they're in at the moment. And then uh, Diener is backstage cutting a promo in front of us, uh, two stacks of chairs. I'm like, is this the only place you had in this whole place to do this? I mean, you might as well put him in a storage room. AJ Francis walks up, who's clearly two feet from him when, when Diener starts the promo. I actually kind of wanted to hear what Diener had to say. I liked where the promo was going. I don't like the design promos. I thought Diener in Violent by Design was good. Once he became the leader, was walking around with the fingers, and I, I thought it was a, a complete fucking bomb. I had interest in it at first, especially when they added Alan Angels, but it just it became a freaking bomb, and the people didn't care. And I don't know if he's going to feud with Khan. The funny thing is they're really good friends in real life. Um, I don't know if they knew each other prior to the design, but they, they became pretty close. No, they did. They did. They did. Um, that's why they, they formed the design. I remember a story on Diener's podcast about um, them on having a match on the indies. But I kind of wanted to hear where Diener was going with this because I liked the, the delivery. He wasn't standing in front of the red background and all that. Like he was just, it felt, even though I thought it looked really cheap, him standing in front of the chairs, it was still, it still brought him down to earth a little bit, a little more personable. And then AJ Francis comes in, Joe Hen, you know, they say Joe Hendry's name. He pops out. And Diener does the clap. And I thought the delivery, though, of AJ Francis says, why did you just clap? I thought that was funny. Um, I think he's a good talker. I didn't think it was like corny that Diener clapped because I think I'm so desperate for him to do something different at this point. I don't want him to go back to fucking Cousin Dean or whatever the hell his name was. Cousin Jake, that's what I'm thinking of. Uh I don't want him to go back to that, but I want to see some change. Speaking of Cousin Jake, I was talking about the Frankie Kazarian promo earlier, and I I guess I got sidetracked or whatever, but yeah, Jake something came out and basically challenged him, and uh, we're going to get them pretty soon. I thought that was a, a nice little exchange, and I thought, I thought Jake did well. I don't know why he's walking around in his wrestling trunks when he wasn't on the card, but um, I thought that was a nice little exchange. But, but to go back to what I was saying about Diener, it would be r- really interesting if AJ Francis somehow manages him and Rich Swan. I know that's like random, but it would be so fresh and different. Like I'd, I'd actually have interest in it. And then Khan, the baddest man on the planet, uh, wrestles Richard Adonis and Ori Gold, a couple jabrones, jabrones. And um, Khan beats him very quickly. They're trying to push this dude. And as I said last week, I probably like him more than the average TNA fan. But the person I like less than the average TNA fan is PCO. And they bring him down and they do the whole entrance. I liked that the minute he sat up, Khan tried to take him out. And then he, he started taking out the orderlies. I thought that was great. A lot of independent wrestlers got jobs on this episode as security orderlies. But... um. They're trying to create a blood feud with these two people, and I couldn't care less. Because when the match happens, it's going to be some kind of no rules, street fight, hardcore, a combat match. It's, you know that's the where they're going to go with it. But they are trying to put some effort into Khan. 
we'll see if it works. He was very popular once upon a time in NXT. Can they tap into that? I don't know. Um, I, so uh, I'm, I'm still optimistic on it because I, I, I like Khan. Don't really care for PCO. So overall, I don't care, but I'm kind of optimistic for what they could potentially do with Khan. Because it's a challenge to have a guy that size and not have him as a lackey or a, bull, a bodyguard. It, it is a challenge. So we'll see if creatively they can pull this off. Josh, Josh Alexander took on Allen Angels, and I loved this match. This was just a different pace for Josh. When the year started, I don't know if I said this when the year started, the year ended, or I guess it doesn't really matter. But I had said it's going to be interesting to see how they develop Josh in 2024 because they've always used the crutch of his wife, of, of bringing Jada on board. They have always had him wrestling for some kind of title. He's talking about scratching and clawing, and his promos are just the same shit and they're just baby i mean uh, white bread so i said they're gonna have a really challenge a really big challenge ahead of them but i thought the win over will osprey really helped him because now he's the world beater and they're adding a different dimension to than to just being the gold standard of tna now he's also you know the tna world beater or whatever they said so they're adding a little bit of a dynamic to him and Alan angels did a really good job in the course of a week of getting Josh to wrestle angry against someone he's not feuding. You know, he usually he wrestles angry against Moose or something like that. Like just for someone on the lower part of the card. Um, this just felt very different than any other Josh Alexander match. And they told a great story to where that anger led him to tapping him out. Like he wasn't going for the C4 spike. He's like, you're going to tap out motherfucker. So this was good. Alan Angel's attacking him before the bell. Like, why doesn't anyone else ever do that? He always has their back to them. <laughs> so uh, Angel's attacking him right away. Like, it pissed him off. He didn't even get a chance to put his his um, headgear on, which he looks better without it, but I know he actually wears it for legit, um, legit reasons because uh, I think he ruptured an eardrum pretty bad one time wrestling, or, and I don't know if he has long-term damage or just – Really doesn't want that to happen again, but I know he kind of has to wear that thing, but he does look a lot better without it. He looks a little more more of a star without it. But this was, I, I thought this was good because it was, it wasn't super long. It made Josh look great. And even Angels look great. Like he got enough offense in to where he, it didn't look overly competitive, but he didn't look like a jobber at the same time. I thought it was the perfect match. Um, These are the kind of matches I'm really, really into. and. Uh, you know, it's not like AEW where everything's a 20-minute match. Everything's competitive. It doesn't matter who's in the ring. You know, we shouldn't feel like Angels can beat Josh, but he did enough to look like, hey, I'm good. I'm a good wrestler. It was perfect. I thought it was perfect. I really did. I hope you guys like that as well. After the match, he was attacked by Simon Gotch. And this was random out of fucking left field. Like, why is he attacking Josh Alexander? And it's another post-match beatdown angle that they're doing every other match and the, you know and anytime you get a match this random um of of josh versus angels you're usually going to get some kind of beat down after some kind of post-match angle tom hannafin always hits us with what the hell and he does it all the time it means nothing but when matt raywall was like he he didn't he it sounded like he genuinely meant he's he just you just hear him go what the hell when he sees Gotch, when he sees his face, um, I was really looking forward to seeing what the dynamic was between the two of them. Um, I, most people don't care about Simon Gotch, but just the fact that Ray Wall is on the roster, I'm I'm really interested in this because I did watch NXT very hardcore at the time they were popular there as the VOD villains. So I'm kind I'm kind of interested in this. He's probably here for a booking just like anybody else. We'll see. That's why Elegant is going to speak next week. Her She looks amazing in that picture, that graphic they put up. I said, ooh, child. Um, she looked really good. And uh, we're getting Frankie Kazarian versus Jake something as well. Moose against Kushida. And, um, of course, the uh, Grizz Grizzly Young Vets versus ABC. I'm glad they didn't do it this week. The ABC is going to win that. And then we're getting Rhino challenging Crazy Steve for the Digital Media Championship. So um, should be a decent enough episode. But I, I want to hear from Ash because – 
as I said, this has to hit. She has to, um, she's likely going to do the same thing Ali is and win the title in her first match, but it has to hit because if this bombs and people don't feel the gimmick and they built it up or she wrestles and it's not good, we're going to be in deep shit. When she was Dana Brooke in NXT, they really did an excellent job of building her up before she debuted as if she was something really special. And then she wrestled her first match. I think it was against blue pants and it was not good. You could tell she was athletic, but it wasn't a good match. And the wind was out of the sail very quickly. And they try to kind of make a main event around there, but it just, it just didn't work. So she's claiming that, you know, this is her and she's been putting work in and it has to all come to a head here. This, this gimmick, this character, they have to hit. Main event was Ed, Eddie Edwards versus Alex Shelley. I wish Eddie Edwards, number one, would get in better shape. I think we all wish that. But now that he's part of the system, I would love for him to switch up his look a little bit. His hair isn't as ridiculous, but I mean, it's still the same ride or die shirt and the same pants and everything is the same with this dude. There is no one in the history of TNA with a, with a better track record of staying bland for a longer period of time than Eddie Edwards. When he does switch it up, people, people are into it, but there's just like no progression for months at a time, years at a time, you know, like I would have just loved him to switch it up a little bit, dude. Um, Alex Shelley switched it up. He has white pants and I thought he looked, he stood out because everyone's always wearing black and then you can't even see him. Just like I was saying about, you know, Khan and uh, PCO earlier, like there were just two heads floating around the ring. So with this Alex Shelley, he, he's got white on it popped and, this match was brought to you by cell phone. They have the most random movie sponsors for these shows. Um, I, from what I understand, the movies are all really bad, <laughs> but they didn't even show any clips. I don't think how did they on maybe on access they did, but there's no clips about cell phone. There's nothing like, what is this about? So someone, someone calls you on the phone and you die. Like don't answer the phone. So uh, we'll see. We'll see. I'm pretty, no, we will not see. I don't care. I'm sure that I'm sure it stinks, but if it's not good for them, but this was a really good main event. Alex Shelley versus Eddie Edwards. My only, my only complaints was two. Alex Shelley won the match, but the, the, the system is now one and three. The system is losing already and they shouldn't be losing. The only person to win is Brian Myers. But they're they are they are one in three I think or one in two because Eddie lost Myers won and they lost a six man so okay so we're gonna say one in two still not a good record um the the other complaint was this was entirely too long this was like a twenty minute match I liked the match but I didn't like the length of it um I will say they're doing a good job with Alex Shelley of keeping him relevant where with Rich Swan, when he lost the title, he faded to obscurity like really quickly. They completely kill his relevancy. Um, you know, he was losing immediately. He was down the bottom of the card, wrestling on pre-shows. Like with Alex Shelley, they're they're keeping it like, hey, he's a main event dude. I actually think what's next for Alex Shelley is that I think um, I think we're gonna get the Alex Shelley versus Chris Saban feud here shorter than later. I mean, sooner than later. I had the storyline in my head the other day, and I I completely forgot it. So when it comes back to me, I'll, I'll share it with you guys. But I think that's where they're going to go next. Because I don't know what the hell else they would. But Alex Alex Shelley won, and if you can you believe it? There was a post match beatdown angle after this. Brian Myers. And uh, Kushida came down and Kevin Knight. So it was three on two because Moose didn't show up. And they're going to kind of build a, a, a three on three match here where this is a, a winnable feud for the system. But Kevin Knight stole the show when he soared off the top rope onto those guys on the outside. He is so athletic. He is so he's he's excellent. There's my dog barking, telling me I want to go outside um, and that you need to shut up and, and wrap up the podcast. So Kevin Knight's so good. He's so good. Um, 
now that he's going to mix it up with the system a little, I think that's a good thing. I don't think he's going to win a whole lot, but you know, we want to see more of him and Kashid is a great um, addition as well. So this will be a great little feud, you know, something winnable for the system. But I think, um, I think we're going once Saban drops the belt to Ali, I think we're going to the motor city machine guns wrestling each other. I think, I think one turns on the other and I had the story in my head the other day and I, completely forgot it but um i think that's where they're going i'm usually wrong you know i'm wrong like 90 percent of the time okay this barking son of a bitch um i'm not i'm not I'm wrong like 90 percent of the time but that's where i'm going with this so i'm your boy bq i'm gonna uh, punch out right here thanks for checking me out i'll be back peace